Miami is one of the most important real estate markets, I think, for the entire U.S. Because last time that we had a downturn, the epicenter of the fall was believed to be Miami. This episode brought to you by Suites at Madison. Meeting in conference rooms for rent by the hour, week, month, or year. Suites at Madison, where business gets done. Check them out at www.downtowntampaoffice.com. Now, on to the show. You are listening to the Invest Florida Real Estate Show, covering topics in lending, buy and sell strategies, property management, hot markets, and tips and tools to guide you along the way on your path to real estate success. You want Florida investment real estate talk? You have come to the right place. And now, our hosts, Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Invest Florida Real Estate Show. This is your co-host, Eric Odom, along with Stephen Silverman. Stephen, what's happening? Well, we're closing down on the end of the year. Uh, People are trying to get deals done. So there's a little bit of a storm before the calm. Yeah, I mean, it's a strange time of the year. Some people want to hurry up and get it done before the end of the year. Some people don't want that transaction to happen until after the first of the year. So it doesn't reflect on their taxes. Uh, Property taxes get delayed another year. Uh, You you close on January 1st. It's... um, that's what the value is. You close on the second and you wait another year to get those revalues on the on the sale. So, you know, but some people want to close at the end of the year. They've got money burning a hole in their pocket. We certainly have seen that a lot in South Florida, Stephen. I mean, there's a South Florida has been a hot market for the last uh, eight, nine years. Well, you know, I always ask myself the question, is Miami really part of America? It just seems to be like from another planet because they have a whole set of influences there that we just don't have in other markets. Yeah, I mean, they have Europeans and, and South Americans that are coming up and, and involving themselves in the Miami market. Uh, it is said that it's the capital of South America, and there's some truth to that. But certainly there's a lot of money that is driving, foreign money that's driving that market. It's tough for us to get Miami folks on the show. Uh, it could be just the fact that we don't normally come in contact on our, in our day-to-day transactions. Uh, you know, we, we buy investment properties for clients, and, and we manage them. And most of that interaction is with other folks inside of the I-4 corridor from Tampa to Orlando. Well, well, not only that, Eric, I mean, we're brokers and we help our clients find deals that will help make them money. And it's become increasingly difficult in South Florida to to find those deals. Well, you know, for us, I mean, we just don't come in contact with people in, in South Florida as much. And so it's harder for us to get uh, good connections. This uh, connection, uh, the guy that we're going to have speaking today is dealing in the South Florida market. He's dealing with all the ingredients that you typically see in the Miami market, the foreign market, the foreign buyers, the foreign investors and property management, buying multifamily. So we're excited to, to hear from him. Um, and we, he was connected to us through one of our listeners and much appreciated that we have some of our listeners that are diligent about giving us referrals and trying to get uh, people plugged into the show. So we're excited to, to have a conversation with him. Before we get rolling, though, I would like to mention that we had a review a guy by the name of Kendall Flyers Wrights. And, and Kendall said he's never coming back. Is that what he said? <laughs> He says uh, that bare knuckles, non sugar coating, real world insider viewpoints of real estate investing, educational for cities outside of Florida and even different industries. Kendall, that's exactly the type of information that helps us get additional guests on the show. The guests like to do a little bit of vetting if they don't know who we are, and uh, and and see if. Um, if we're, it's a good fit for them to come on. And, you know. and, and that being said, for anybody listening to the show, if you enjoy it, please give us a review. Those reviews help us get better guests, and that's better listening for all of us. Absolutely. It, it, it pays it all forward. So, guys, uh, we, uh, Dent Kendall, we appreciate you. Anybody who's not done it, appreciate you go on there and do it on either the iTunes store or on the Google Play store. Much appreciated. And, and Stephen, unless you got something else, let's get rolling into our South Florida apartment guest. Let's, let's do it. Today we have with us Daniel Jaramillo. Daniel is the CEO of Strategic Properties based in Miami, Florida. This is a real estate investment and property management company specializing in multifamily and property management. Daniel, 
Welcome to the Invest Florida show. Thank you very much, Stephen. Hey, Daniel, really appreciate you investing the time with us today. And you've got a pretty rich background. I mean, you're doing a lot of different things from building to managing to syndication. And we're going to try to touch on each one of these things things later in the in the episode, but why don't you just give us a brief overview of how you got into real estate? Well, um, I started with one unit. So basically it was given to my family by, because of a debt and we had to uh, manage the property and it happened to be a section eight property. So there was a little bit to learn about it on how to get that turned over in the records under our name and do the closing, do start receiving the rent payments from section eight and then eventually handling an eviction on it. But we thought we, we saw the potential from just that one unit. And this was when I was 21 years old and I decided that this was for me. So we, so I started just um, buying more properties. I started with a family fund and um, then with friends and family and started growing to up to about 300 units. And when I got to that point, we decided to put up together a, a property management company for it. That's now 2,600 units in total in three different states. Now you're down in Miami, correct? Yes, I am. Yeah, I live in Miami. I've been living here for 20 years. And, and where, where are you from originally? I'm from Colombia, South America. So how long have you been living in Miami? Uh, t- right now, 20 years. Wow. 20 years. Okay. And, and so you, you started with this first section eight housing and then you started a family fund and you're buying other multifamily or were you doing single family or, or, or something else? And I remember the order it was exactly six units, six single units in the same building. Uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I thought I had struck gold in that particular condominium, which was about 250 units in the, and I ended up owning about, um, six units and managing those. But then when we saw how much money was coming in and that everything was being managed correctly and the, that there was a, a flow of cash flow, we decided to go a little bit bigger and went to a 16 unit multifamily building. And, and the people that, that were investing with you, they were friends and family or, or were you out soliciting other investors? We first started with friends and family, and and that was a handful already because a lot of people wanted to get into real estate, but just they just didn't know how to do it or they didn't have the time, and they wanted to rely on somebody that knew what they were doing. So I accept I started accepting friends and family funds after we were over the one hundred unit mark, and that's how we got to about three hundred. Now there was you've been doing single family and multifamily though, correct? That is correct. Yep. yep. And you're doing also some, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in the Miami market? I mean, it's kind of a crazy place and it's, we've seen yeah. some, a, a significant appreciation, appreciation and value. So why don't you give us a little overview of what's happening down there? Sure. So Miami is one of the most important real estate markets, I think, for the entire U.S. Because last time that we had the downturn, the epicenter of the fall was believed to be Miami in uh, some of the properties here. And uh, I could track it down to one single building in which we were going to manage a property there. And I could see that the numbers were just crazy. Um, A property that was sold initially for $200,000 and then it was resold and resold and resold for so many times up to $850, $850, I'm sorry, uh, just after a few years, which didn't make any sense. And um, so we, I started seeing that trend and, and we, that together, of course, with all the money coming in from uh, South America, from countries like Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, that's one of the biggest um, group of owners that we have is from Argentina. And, uh, and they were all investing like crazy here in, in South Florida together with the people that lived in in South Florida, but that were going to their second and third and fourth home as an investment. So right now we're, we're experiencing high prices in my opinion. I mean, I've seen that, uh, that, that we're very near the top 
or at the top. And uh, I don't see that the prices will slip as much as they did last time, but we're bound to hit a a sort of a, a small recession or adjustment, I would say. And so what are you seeing in terms of uh, you know, deals when they come on the market, is it is it like it was before the downturn where there's, you know, f- multiple offers put in the day that something goes live and the market's pretty heated? Are you still seeing that or are you seeing some maybe slowdown in the Miami market? No, it was like that about two and a half years the, the, that we would have multiple offers. Right now, the deals, what, what has happened, which is the first effect of the downturn, is that they slow down the number of transactions. So not necessarily that the prices go down, but it's just in the number of transactions, like for, for 100 houses to be sold, uh, instead of selling them in, in, in a month, you, you take, you know, two to three months. So at the same price, more or less. So you're not sacrificing on price, but you're sacrificing on the time, which financially it's money anyway. But then the next adjustment is it will will be the adjustment on on the sale prices. So those I do exp- I've seen in some areas that that uh, some reductions and some corrections, but we're not there yet. So, so while you're looking at multifamily, what kinds of cap rates are investors looking for now in in South Florida? Well, so South Florida is tricky in the sense that. Uh, We have a bunch of smaller multifamily buildings, which are the 10 unit, the 20 unit. Those, if you, if you're buying them at a hundred thousand dollars, then you're investing about a million to to two million dollars, which is not much money. I mean, it's a lot of money for, for some investors, but it's not something that uh, investment funds would be interested in. So what ends up happening is that retirees from other countries, especially South America, are bringing their money in and investing it with the hopes that they're going to be renting the units and and making some money out of it. What uh, the, the sad story, though, is a lot of them don't know how to do the due diligence or don't know how to crunch the numbers on some of these multifamily deals and what they expected to be a six and a half cap rate ends up being a, a four cap rate uh and if they're, if the they're reasons lucky. are a, f- a four <laughs> yeah. a four yeah. from from their their expectation was was probably that they're going to hit six and a half cap rate but it ends up being a, a four cap rate so th- that's really bad and and the reason and they could have found uh they could have if they're, known if they're that, lucky daniel i mean a lot of these people get in and there's deferred maintenance and these other issues and the damn thing never cash flows Exactly, exactly. But there, there's even more silly mistakes than that. Because sometimes, you know, okay, yeah, I didn't do the inspection on the maintenance and, and something happened or the pipe broke, which was really hard to tell from, from, from the due diligence. But other things like insurance. So brokers here will say something like, oh, yeah, I did all the numbers. Here's uh, your property. And, uh, and it doesn't have an insurance line item. <laughs> doesn't and, have property and management ask, line. <laughs> And, and they're like, well, you if you're going to pay cash, you don't need to buy insurance for it. Well, you're not required to buy insurance for it. Brutal. And we're but obviously you do like or at, le- at least when you're running the numbers as a ca- to to find the cap rate, you need to put in the number as a, a, at least as a placeholder to know really what the cap rate is. So so you get a lot of that like misinformation especially from brokers, not all brokers. I don't want to generalize, but, but you know who you are that, uh, <laughs> that may be trying to, <laughs> you know who you yeah. are. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know who you are. The, the ones that, that, uh, that conveniently forget some expenses, well, like insurance or the management fee, management fee is another one. Is, management fee, yeah, it uh, always gets left off. Yeah. Or vacancy and delinquency. The, uh, I've, I've seen pro formas doing a hundred percent occupancy. And I'm like that there does not exist, not even in Miami where the vacancy rates are so low. Are you ever going to get a hundred percent occupancy in a 10 unit building? That just doesn't happen. So, so those things are, you need to be aware of and, and, and to make sure that, uh, that you're not making those silly mistakes. I want to, cause it, it's just education or being uh, advised by somebody that knows what they're doing. And, and what about the property management part for these investors from um, 
um, from South America or even locally? What what's changed in property management, and and what mistakes are they making? Sure. So first thing, first first mistake is thinking that they don't need property management. So what uh, if you're um, a lot of these uh, owners from South America end up buying condos, thinking that that's going to be less of a risk. So condos have a couple problems. One of them is that um, you have higher expenses because you're paying an association fee, which you wouldn't be paying if you have a, a single family home. So, but they, since they're coming from countries like Buenos, uh, from countries like Argentina or Colombia, like in cities, in big cities like Bogota and Buenos Aires, where where the uh, where the properties are, where there are a bunch of real estate that's just buildings, then they're safer and they think it's a safer investment to go straight to the condos. And what uh, they end up doing is asking their realtor who found them that property to just manage it for them. Sometimes these realtors will not charge a fee, which is a mistake on their part. They're just doing it as a favor but once they start doing it as a favor, then the the expectation from the owner is that it's going to be taken care of, and uh, and there are many things that could go wrong in 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 uh, property management, starting with a tenant that doesn't pay the rent, a uh, problem with maintenance that could go as like we had one case in which uh, one of the units the the water broke, and it ended up being a thirty thousand dollar damage because they damaged the two units below them. So th those things can be taken care of if they're taken care of at the right time by a property manager that has 24 seven service and can receive calls anytime, then they could have done it the, the whole repair in maybe less than two or three hours instead of uh, 24 hours to get some uh, plumber to get the job done and end up costing them $30,000. So, that's one of the things that, that you need to be aware of, that you need to hire a proper property manager. But then going to your question again, like things that have changed now are te technology, basically. With technology nowadays, you need to have somebody in property management that can uh, give you inform information immediately, that you do not need to request information on what's going on at your property. So what I'm talking about is a portal, for instance, somewhere where you can log in out of whatever country you're in and you know whether your tenant deposited the money today or yesterday or spending to be collected or what's the status on that. And if there's any work orders that were created as of right now, and if there's anything pending on your end, if uh, all your bills have been paid for you, so do you have any problems with liens, that your property taxes are up to date, all of these things that, uh, that you need to be aware of, but you have to do it through a portal. So so that's very important in choosing a, a property manager. Let's talk a little bit about your underwriting, um, the bogeys that you look for, because it, you, you told us that your the last couple of purchases you had were outside of the state of Florida. So ha, let's talk about the process of how you're finding deals. And then what are you know, this is the issue. Time is the issue with everybody. You know, you're with real estate. There's thousands and thousands of deals and you got to be able to filter through the ones that are suiting you. So what are the some of the bogeys that you look for, the important data points to make you convinced that this might be a deal worth considering further? Okay. So I'll start with the first part is why out of, uh, why are we investing outside of Florida? And the reason is uh, cap rates. Again, the, the returns, the returns in Florida have shrunk way too much. And, and maybe we can get that to that, to, to that later and explain why. But, um, so we, we started looking at uh, other states such as Georgia and Missouri that have a similar law to what Florida has. It's, there are still landlord states, so we're comfortable with them. As a matter of fact, Georgia is pretty much the same type of contract that we use here, we use over there. And, and, and so we don't need to study anything beyond that, like in New York, that's completely different. Um, and then to find the deals, you have, well, there's the 110 and one formula, right? It's you, you need to see a hundred deals, make offer on 10 and uh, maybe close on one. So it does take a lot of time. 
it does take a lot of seeing properties. Uh, I've, I've seen, I get so many deals offered to me that, um, that we end up, I end up seeing the same building from three different brokers and <laughs> at, at three different, at three, at three very different times. So what I'm able to do is go back in, in my, in my emails and seeing like, what, what were they asking before and what, what has changed? So that's, that's uh very interesting to know, but the, the best one I've had is a guy offering my own building to me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, what so, did you buy? That, that was hilarious. And, and I wasn't really selling. It was, he, I, I said that I may entertain an offer from somebody. And I did speak to, I, I have that conversation with many brokers. So I must've had a conversation with some broker and told him that, and he must've told some other people at his office or whatever, because it was a different person. And then he calls me and says, Hey, listen, I have a deal for you. I'm like, really? Okay. Which one? It's like, this, this is like, but wait, isn't that on this address? But I own that building. And so <laughs> we, we both laughed and that's it. So yeah, obviously yeah. <laughs> no, no, no deal there to be done. <laughs> but, um, anyway, we, we do go through a lot of, of deals and there are thumb rules that you can go through very quickly to, to know whether you want to pursue something or not. So one very simple rule, and this was taught by my dad, <laughs> It's uh, it's the one percent rule, and it's it's very common in in Colombia. As a matter of fact, that's where he brought it from. It's uh, your if your rent amount, your monthly rent amount, is above one percent of the value of the property, you're looking at a pretty decent return. So that would be my first filter to see whether I'm going to go get into something or not. So to give you an example, if the property is if they're asking a hundred thousand dollars, uh, I want to know that the property can rent for at least a thousand dollars a month. So that's one good, good, um, rule of thumb that, that I go over. And then I do the pr pro forma, which is I, I put in some vacancies, some delinquency, the expenses for that particular property, which may be very high if it's a condo, or it may be very low if it's a, a townhouse that doesn't have an association, you know, because there's no common areas. So it, it that that's when I start getting really to the bottom line and understanding whether a deal is good or not. With multifamily, it's more or less the same thing. Just you have a lot more expenses. You need to take into consideration many, many more things. High capital improvements, reserves for capital improvements, the the payroll that you're going to be paying on site, how much it is, what's the management fee, all of these things that, that you need to take into consideration. Talk to us a little bit about syndication. You've got uh, sure. your deals that you've got going on now, and you know you're you, you're not you're still looking in Florida, but you're considering stuff outside of Florida, right? You haven't just closed the door on Florida investment. It's just it's harder to find deals in Florida. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Yeah, no, no doubt. I'd prefer if I find deals here. Okay. So what, what I'm doing is I'm syndicating smaller deals here and, uh, and the bigger deals I'm having to do out of, out of Florida. So the, uh, the smaller deals. And when I say smaller is typically, uh, let's buy four houses together that average about $200,000 each. So that's a million dollars there. And, and I can syndicate, I can try to find a, a few, few houses at the auction and I've done several of those deals. At the auction from the, from the county foreclosures? From the county, from okay. the county directly. Yeah, we, we can go into that topic. That's also interesting. It's, it's riskier a lot. So you need to know what you're doing or, or, <laughs> or you start losing money there. But I'm also doing the, the syndication for bigger multifamily buildings in, in the states like Missouri and Georgia. And the way that works is that um, a $10 million deal, for instance, a 200-unit apartment building that's being sold at $50,000 a door, you can, if, if it's stabilized or somewhat stabilized, you would be able to find a 
loan from a bank that would be a, a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. Uh, right now, they'd be averaging about 4.6% in, in interest rate that you can get on it with a 30-year amortization. So it's it's a pretty good loan that you can get on it. And uh, then you need to raise the rest of the money, which let's say it's a, another $4 million. And those $4 million, typically what you could find is you would put in 10% to 20% of that money. So maybe four hundred to $800,000 of your own money, which is what they call skin in the game. And then the rest of the money comes from, from an investment fund. So investment funds out of New York, even Latin American funds have been investing here as well. But there are plenty of funds here that are, are looking for deals because there are, there are very few. There are very few out there. So if you do find one, there's plenty of amount, money out there to, to back you up. It's, so, it's so, The harder part is to find the deals. So, so, so what kind of cap rates are you getting on these types of deals in Mississippi as opposed to Florida or, right. or Georgia? So, bear in mind that my specialty is section eight and C class properties. So, and and by, and by that, I mean, uh, you have properties rated from a plus all the way to the properties. And, um, and the ones that I specialize are C to C plus and B minus properties. So for those C type properties, you can expect a, Mm, it's uh, what well, I'd like to buy at a six and a half cap with an expectation to increase the rents, maybe lower some expenses and get to a seven and a half, maybe eight squeeze that. I like a, so that'd be a great deal. If I'm able to stabilize the property on an eight cap for other deals, what I've seen is that for B type or, or a type properties, Cap rates are far more compressed and they're in the four and a half percent for or even lower for A's. Here in Miami, it's it's they they almost don't have a cap rate. They're like a, at a three cap rate for a trophy property. And um, people are just buying to just hold, basically, or or expecting for the market to to increase in value. But the, the basics are not there anymore. There's it it, it doesn't make sense for you to, to buy, if it doesn't make sense for you to find a loan from a bank, then you can't leverage. You're basically putting money at a, at a T-bond with, with more risk. That's, mm-hmm. that's sure. how I see it. Before we move on, I want to finish up with a subject we're talking about with syndications. Um, sure. the, on the syndications, talk to us about the structure of the syndication and the timing when you're going into contract and you know this is going to be a syndicated deal, how much time are you allotting to be able to raise the funds in the contract that you have with the seller? So talk to us about the structure of that of that contract you have when you're buying and the syndication is what's buying. Yeah, sure. You're, you're talking about what's first the the egg or the chicken in it, and <laughs> and it's it's very difficult because you you can't just secure a a good deal and put it under contract and then find the money. Right. Like it doesn't work that way. It, right. You have to find people that are investors or an investment fund that's already comfortable with you, and that takes time. So basically, let's do, let's do lunch. Let's do dinner. <laughs> Let's do a couple of dates and I'll show you what I'm doing. Let's go to one of my properties, go and see it, feel it, see how I'm doing property management differently than everybody else or better or or any other questions that you may have. And that may take a couple of weeks. So we already have a couple of investment funds that know us and that we know them that would feel, feel comfortable if we were to bring them a deal, even though we've never done a deal before. So once we have that, pool of, of, of investors. And it could just be two, you know, like, or maybe three investors and, and that three, three investment funds that you're going to work with. Then you start finding a deal. Once you, you get to the deal and you put it under contract, you're going to have due diligence on it. And typically for a multifamily building, you're going to have to ask for about 30 days, 30 days due diligence, 30 days to close. That's the typical times that we're seeing nowadays. It's now is becoming so hard to find really good deals that those times have shrunk even more. So now I'm seeing 
people getting into a 10 to $15 million deal with a 10 day due diligence, which mm. is crazy. Yeah. But they're doing it. But they're so, so you're competing against those guys. So you need to be prepared to, to, to have the funds ready from your investor to know that uh, what you're doing is going to play out or else you're going to just start spending money and time. So it's not a blind, it's not a blind fund. Then you, you've just know that they're ready waiting in the wings when you pr- yes. bring the opportunity. Or a certain type of deal. But what if, exactly. but when you're, when you've only done a handful of transactions and you don't have the track record, how, what would you suggest to people that are trying to get into that business that are trying to syndicate, um, it's, it's tough. So what do you, what, how do you explain to them how to get, do you just team with guys like you and you bring you in or, and, and, and how does that work? Like, uh, you, you mean like people that, uh, that want to start doing syndication, like how could they get started? Correct. Let's say, let's say they've already done a handful of transactions. They've, they already have, uh, they're a key person on, sure. on, on Fannie Mae debt. Um, they've, um, they've got a, but they want to do more deals. And the only way they can sure, do sure. that is is with other people's money, but they've not done syndication before. So here they are. Um, yeah, uh, I like to partner with those type of people. Like they need to bring something of value to the table. So sometimes I've, I've brought in uh, people that are that have the funds. Like maybe it's like, hey, listen, I have the uh, the, the family office that I know that if we pitch them, they'll hear you out and we can get the fund. So that's, that one's a, a, an easy one, but there are others that, that are like, for instance, we ended up partnering with one gentleman that had a lot of experience in construction and remodeling. So we're like, okay, this guy can, you know, if, if we find a deal that needs a lot of, of, of uh, like a fixer upper, this guy can provide value. So let's, include him in the team. I even give him a, a company email address. I don't have a problem. Like once I vet the, the person and, and I feel comfortable with them, then you're, you're part of the team now. And so when we start basically raising the funds as if it were, as if he was a, 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 a partner in the, in our company and we start looking for deals, looking for investors and he didn't have to put a single dollar. He just had to just go to the meetings explain what he knows, explain why the property that we saw has the potential to, to bring it up. And, um, so that, that's one way of doing it, but there's plenty of other ways. Like maybe you can bring, uh, the, a good mortgage on it, which is not that hard to find, but, but you know, it's, it's a lot of time invested into, but so if you have that particular partner that can do that for you, then great. And you have something else that you're solving. So I don't know if that answers your question yeah, def- more or less. De- definitely, you just you're, you're being creative. Uh, people are going to have to yeah. be creative in terms of how to how to get started. It's it's partnering with other people. It's trying to find you know you you if you have a deficiency in the experience side, uh, you try to find somebody like yourself that would exactly. that that would you would be able to partner with and get that experience. So the next time you've got that resume to be able to push to the funds and be able to go to talk to the funds and say, hey, you were principal in this transaction and we can do more. Exactly, exactly. Oh, one more thing that I wanted to add to the syndication process. This might be interesting for people to know is if you're putting 10% of the money for a $10 million deal, like you're bringing a million dollars. Again, that's what I'm calling the skin on the game. Some funds will allow you to put in only half of that. So basically 5% and you bring the other 5% from another investor. So, but it, but it wasn't them in other words. So, Why so they that? know that, that, that you're responsible for at least 5% and that the other 5% is from somebody that you know. So the investment fund, some investment funds will be comfortable with that. And uh, the way that you structure a promote, which is the other part of the deal is because you're not working for free is if you're coming up with 10% of the money, you can expect to get 20% of their return. That's probably the easiest structure out there. So um, that's, that's the one compensation way for it. the person putting the deal together. Exactly. Okay. So the, the promote for, for putting the deal together, it's that that's one way of charging others, other ways that are a little bit more complex, um, but, uh, but there are out there and they're very common are preferred returns. So you, you have 
what what the investment fund ends up agreeing with you is like they put in 90% of the money, you put in 10%. So who, whatever return comes in, there's going to be a 6% preferred return to the investors before any money is allocated to as, as a promote. And then whatever's above the 6%, gets divided 50 50 mm-hmm. or 60 40 mm-hmm. something like that so so you can all that's a, a different structure then other more complex structures are based on irr so internal rate of return in which you have a waterfall structure in which you know the first um to, let's say eight percent irr comes to the investor completely then the next three points go to are divided 50 50 and then the next two points are divided 80 20 so you're you're very incentivized to get a really high return so that you can get more money so it's but then you know there's plenty of structures like that i just named three okay so just you know when we're talking about how how the cap rates have gone so low and how difficult it is to find properties now does that create opportunities for construction and and what are your feelings about that and also um is there an opportunity to do construction that isn't only luxury construction yes great question so for us it's um you you're absolutely right about how as the cap rates have compressed the values have increased that we are finally able to build as a matter of fact, my 10 year partner in this company is a builder, but he hasn't really built in the last eight years or so. And and the reason why is because we why we specialize is in, is in lower income properties. And there wasn't. Yeah, it's hard to make a way the that, we, that, that we can make it work. Yeah, yeah it's like w- w- if we were going to be building and paying one hundred and fifty dollars a square foot when we could have bought the property next door for $75 a square foot, even though it's older, there's no point. Like we, every time that we get into a deal, whether it's construction or not construction, we, we do all the numbers and see whether it plays out or not. And, and for these many years, for the past eight years, except for the past year, at least, we've, we've only seen that it doesn't make sense. Now it's starting to make sense or it, it's it, it, now it's making sense. As a matter of fact, if you remember my 1% formula, we just finished building 30 townhouses in Miami Gardens and uh, the, our cost per townhouse was $202,000. So it was a $6 million project and each one of those $200,000 townhouses can get rented for nineteen fifty. So it's, almost hits that one percent but the good thing is that it, since it's new it has less vacancy and less repairs right so so we're able to make our uh, like a really safe aid cap after after building it on, on that one it was a, an amazing deal so when we saw that we we saw the potential to doing another one now the the second one that we're doing it's 130 units in an opportunity zone for those that are not familiar with opportunity zones, it's basically the IRS, and this is a, a process that has been in the in the government for several years now, but that was finally approved. Um, you get some exemptions or tax exemptions for for investing in opportunity zone, mainly that whatever money that you bring out of whatever capital gains, I'm sorry, that you bring out of any other business, it doesn't have to be real estate. You can reinvest into an opportunity zone and that will have a dual effect the first effect is that you won't have to pay capital gain taxes on on those gains that you just had until 2026 2026 so december 2026 you you can just wait for that year and then pay those uh, capital gains but the second effect is that whatever money you invested into the opportunity zone you're going to be able to uh what what it, and if you hold it for at least 10 years whatever gain comes out of that investment is completely tax free and then there are a number of rules it has to qualify but um, like um like it, you can't just invest on a building that's an opportunity zone 
and put money in it, uh, love a few dollars. It has to be more than 100% of the value of the, of the building. So it, it, for construction, it's perfect because there's no building there. So automatically, whatever you build on it qualifies. So we were scouting for, for deals and we thought if we found this piece of land, that's um, a little bigger than, than an acre. And it was in an area that I'm very comfortable in investing. It's near Opalaka. Uh, this is called Westview. And uh, we, we put in $1.4 million to buy the land. And that gives us a density to put it about, to put in about 130 units. So that's, Roughly a little bit more than ten thousand dollars a unit in land, which is not much. Like uh, that, it's a pretty good deal. And after all said and done, we're expecting that we're going to have a cost of around one hundred and fifty dollars to one hundred and seventy dollars per unit. Per, I'm sorry, per square foot. So going back to the numbers, it's it's we're trying to hit that again that eight cap rate once the, the property is built so it's it's a pretty decent deal okay awesome so daniel i'm sure there are people who would like to contact you and learn a little bit more and perhaps work with you how can people reach you yeah i mean everything from sure. your syndication deals to maybe they got a deal for you on the apartment side a lot of listeners to the show a lot of different uh, folks so t t tell them tell them how to how they can uh, contact you Sure. The, our website is strategicproperties.com. So you can find a little bit more about us and we have a contact form there. Or you can just send me an email directly. I have a, a shorter version of my email is DJ, my initials, at strategicproperties.com. Again, that is DJ at strategicproperties.com. Awesome. Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, it was awesome having you on the show. Yeah, we uh, we like getting the South Florida folks. It's not easy. You guys are, it must be busier than uh, us up here in Tampa because we we get a we have an easier time getting the I four corridor people on our show than the South South Florida people. So really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, and speaking with us. And and, and I'm sure some of the uh, investors and foreign investors and all other folks that might be interested in the South Mar Florida market get a lot out of this such conversation, Daniel. Thank you very much for inviting me, Stephen and Eric. I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity and um, hope to hear from you guys again and love to join you again on, on future shows. We'll do it. And that was Daniel Jaramillo from Strategic Properties in South Florida. Always great to get the South Florida guys on the show, get a little update on what's happening in the uh, South Florida market. And, uh, you know, Daniel's got his feet in in two worlds he's and he's dealing with the foreign investors as well as the domestic investors so um you know steven what were your thoughts about about daniel well one of the things that daniel's telling us is that the market's changing you know suddenly now it's making sense to do construction again and that hasn't been the case for quite some time the other thing that as a broker we always look at is for people to listen only to brokers who may not always be the right people to talk to and get the most qualified advice, you have to do your due diligence in everything, but do the due diligence. Check on things that you're investing in before you make the investments. Yeah, and I mean, folks that are coming in, foreigners, they, they buy a lot. Foreign nationals buy a lot of single-family homes in the state of Florida, and some of them try to make that next step into buying and multifamily investment properties or retail or, or office or whatever. And it's tough. When you're coming from a place that you really don't know, you're relying on the, a team to be able to help you make decisions. And if you're from outside the area, you really don't know who you can trust and who you can't. So it can be somewhat problematic. And Daniel points out, you know, some of those issues with uh, what happens with foreign nationals. They, they, uh, they step in it. Unfortunately, it happens. Um, and, 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 you know, the only way you can learn it is to, is to do deals. And, and sometimes the best entree into getting a deal done is to partner with somebody else. I think that's kind of my take my primary takeaway from it. Uh, Steven, as always, Daniel was a great guest and we've got great guests that we've been speaking to now over five years. So where five can people, years. five years, that's a lot years. of episodes. Yeah. And so the place to go to get this encyclopedia of information is www.investfloridashow.com. We always have interesting people talking about, and they have skin in the game. They 
tell us how they invest and what they do and everybody can learn from it. So download the apps. Listen while you're mobile or while you're in the gym. Get it from the Google, from Google or from Apple and just keep on listening. Guys, as always, we appreciate the time that you invest with us each and every episode. And until next time, hasta la vista. You've just listened to the Invest Florida podcast with Eric Odom and Stephen Silverman. Join us every week for actionable real estate investment ideas. And of course, visit our website at www.investfloridashow.com for more shows and tips on how to earn a cash flow in the real estate market in Florida. While hosts and producers of the Invest Florida show have no reason to doubt the validity of comments of our guests, we do not warranty their accuracy. Please check with your legal, financial, and tax advisors before entering into any investment. Returns will vary from person to person and deal to deal based on unique circumstances. All information expressed in this show is for educational purposes only. Opinions of the guests are not necessarily shared by the hosts and producers of the Invest Florida Show.